The Magnificent Montague, starring Monty Woolley. Yes, it's the Magnificent Montague, the Saturday night transcribed feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by Chesterfield. Always milder, better-tasting, cooler-smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. By Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, and first in television. Before we hear from the Magnificent Montague, let's hear from Chesterfield. You see it in the newspapers. No unpleasant aftertaste. You hear it on the radio. No unpleasant aftertaste. You see it on television. No unpleasant aftertaste when you smoke Chesterfield. It's the biggest plus in cigarette history. Science discovered it. You can prove it. Science discovered that of all brands tested, Chesterfield, and only Chesterfield, leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. Prove it yourself. Smoke a pack of Chesterfields. They're always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That's the biggest plus in cigarette history. No unpleasant aftertaste. Science discovered it. Prove it yourself. Buy Chesterfield today. And now, the magnificent Montague. <laughs> Although Edwin, the magnificent Montague, left the stage to become Uncle Goodhart, hero of an afternoon radio program, he has remained a member and a moving force of the Proscenium Club, that stalwart organization of Shakespearean actors who live in an unemployed world of their own. All year long, the Proscenium Club waits for their one big event, their annual Fourth of July picnic and outing at Shakespeare Grove. It is the morning of the great event. In the Montague apartment, his wife Lily and Agnes the maid are making up lunch baskets. Agnes is very happy. Have you got the mustard, mustard, mustard? Have you got the pickles, pickles, pickles? Have you got the relish, relish, relish? Have you got the... Agnes. Yeah, honey? Oh, you have the lunch basket almost packed. What a picnic. Look at this food. Fried chicken, potato salad, deviled eggs, chocolate cake. Boy, are those ants going to live. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everything looks so... Oh, wait, Agnes. What, honey? I just remembered. Edwin hates deviled eggs. So what? Well, it'll spoil the picnic for him. What picnic? Well, Agnes, isn't that lunch for the Proscenium Club 4th of July picnic? Are you kidding? This is for my picnic. Your picnic? Yeah, my social club. The unattached girls of East 37th Street throwing one. <laughs> oh, dear. I thought that lunch was for Edwin. I don't worry. I'll fix him one right now. Oh, good. Have I got the poison, poison, poison? <laughs> Have I got the arsenic, arsenic, arsenic? Agnes. Why don't you come along with us? Honey, please don't trap me into one of those outdoor memorial services the Proscenium Club calls a picnic. But, Agnes, it's always great fun. That picnic with Edwin's old actor friend. Fun? With those stuffy old actors? Oh, Agnes, you know on the picnic they're very informal. Oh, they're a real fun-loving bunch of madcaps. <laughs> Sitting around under the trees with their spats unbuttoned. <laughs> Agnes, you, you know there's always swimming. Now, that's worth saying. The swimming suits those old fogies climb into. <laughs> they may be a little conservative and old-fashioned. Whatever it is, it's the only place you can still see a double-breasted bathing suit with a belt in the back. <laughs> oh, come now, Agnes. The campfire with those long, dull recitations from Shakespeare. And then your husband takes over with his annual rendering of Hamlet's soliloquy. I can still hear the voice ringing through the woods. Mm, it really gets them. It must. Last year, 200 moose came running looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Agnes, it won't be the same without you. No, honey, I'm all set to go with the unattached girls of East 37th Street. The entertainment committee's lined up a boat ride up to Bear Mountain. The invitation says campfire, songs, and dancing. Dancing at Bear Mountain? Oh, then you all have dates. Dates? Those girls? Are you kidding? Well, who are you going to dance with? The bears, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Agnes. Wait till the bears get a load of my club. There'll be an early hibernation this year. <laughs> oh, come along to the proscenium club picnic with us, Agnes. Edwin will be... 
Oh, oh, I hear him. He's out. Now comes the warming of the magnificent Montague's tonsils. Air raid, air raid, go to your shelter. (laughs) Agnes, please. uh, uh, Good morning, Lily. Good morning, Edwin. Gad, you look lovely this morning, Lily. Good morning, Mr. Montague. Gad. Now, Edwin, Agnes is very attractive this morning. Attractive? Lily, must she always wear those curlers in her hair when she's trying to attract lightning? <laughs> Look who's talking about beauty, the face with the hanging gardens. <laughs> oh, please stop. Now, both of you. It's so nice to have a man around the house, and we're stuck with a monster. <laughs> ah, Independence Day. This is the beginning of the fourth. Must we have a maid who talks as if she just finished a fifth? <laughs> Agnes, don't answer him. Bring in Edwin's breakfast. Ah, breakfast. My morning tussle with Tomaine. <laughs> oh, stop picking on her. You have a big day in front of you. Right after your radio broadcast this afternoon, we're going to the Proscenium Club annual picnic. Yes, Lily. Tonight, around the campfire with all my faithful friends of the stage around me, I can forget for a moment that I, the magnificent Montague, deserted the theater for radio. From Hamlet to Uncle Goodhart is five times a week. I were a rogue and peasant slave am I. My offense is rank, oh, guilty conscience. Villainy, I am thy chief. What do you want with your eggs, Ham? <laughs> I mean, what do you want with your eggs, Ham? <laughs> Over the slip of the tongue. Agnes, if that tongue of yours ever slipped, it would have hit the ground. <laughs> Edwin, don't feel so guilty about going into radio. Tonight, when you give your annual reading of Hamlet's soliloquy, you'll again be the magnificent Montague. Mm. And don't you think you'd better rehearse it? I rehearse Hamlet's soliloquy? Oh, well, shame on you, Lily. I know it, I know the back of my own hand. To be or not to be. That is the problem. Well, that is the question. That is the question. <laughs> Whether it is safe or in the mind to... Nobler in the mind. A nobler in the mind to suffer the arrows and slings. Slings and arrows. Slings and arrows <laughs> of courageous fortune. Outrageous fortune. Outrageous fortune. <laughs> or to take arms against a pack of trouble. A sea of trouble. A sea of trouble. <laughs> a mess of trouble. A mess of trouble. <laughs> This is fun. Quiet. To die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance to wake. Perchance to dream. Uh, perchance to dream. Perchance to snore. Perchance to... <laughs> Lily, get her out of here. Quiet, Agnes. Go on. To die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance to dream. Hey, there's the rub. Oh, bravo, Edwin. <laughs> and you thought I didn't remember it. <laughs> Mr. Montego, you sure know it like the back of your own hand. Thank you. You must have been wearing gloves for 50 years. <laughs> Excuse me, Agnes, for exposing your delicate brain to culture. Hereafter, with you in the room, we will only quote from the racing form. <laughs> oh, never mind, Agnes Edwin. You sounded wonderful. They'll cheer you at the campfire tonight. Now, I've got to get things ready for the picnic. Wait, Lily. What is it, Edwin? Lily, I'm not going. Edwin! Well, you haven't missed a proscenium club 4th of July picnic in your whole life. I know, but Lily, this year I can't face it. Edwin. Lily, the club never found out. I've deserted their ranks for the gold of radio. I'm not going. It's a mockery. Oh, Edwin, the proscenium picnic is more than just a group of Shakespearean actors having an outing. I know. It's the 4th of July. It's more than just the date of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It's where we first met. And the day it was signed. <laughs> Quiet, Lily. Now I remember we did meet at a Proscenium Club picnic. I was in the Gary Gaieties at the time and came to the picnic with one of the fellows from the show. And I was playing King Lear. Now, what girl did I bring? Betsy Ross. <laughs> Please. Remember we sat next to each other at the campfire, singing the big song of that year. Now, what was it? Marching through Georgia. <laughs> All right, Agnes, just for that, no kennel ration for you tonight. 
Oh, what a picnic that was. You were after me all day. How you flirted me. <laughs> How you ran from me. Oh, you acted so coy. You played so hard to get. You were so hard to take. <laughs> Please, Agnes, these are our memories. Oh, Edwin, we must go to that picnic. Lily, we'll find that same tree we carved our initials in. That little brook you carried me across. It's still all there, Lily. The same tree, the same brook, same moon... The same two people, you and I. Hello, young lovers, whoever you are. Hello, young lovers. Oh, quiet. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you recapture that mad moment. <laughs> oh, yes, we were mad. Mad? You must have been nuts. Lily, <laughs> when we see the little tree again where we carved our initials, something new is going to be hanging from it. Agnes. <laughs> Then you're going to the picnic, Edwin? Am I promised a kiss in the moonlight from a certain beautiful lady? <laughs> if a certain handsome and dashing gentleman is there to carry a certain lady across the brook again, how can I refuse? I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be sick. <laughs> so help me, Lily, I'm going to kill her. Your broadcast, and we all have to get ready for the picnic. I'll pick you and Agnes up right after my broadcast. Oh, Edwin, Agnes can't go on the picnic with us. She can't? No, nope. she's going up the river with her friends. I knew it. The Kapalma <laughs> Committee is back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Edwin. Agnes has an outing of her own to go to. For the first time, she won't be with us. Shakespeare Grove and no Agnes. This is really going to be a picnic. Goodbye! We'll be back with the magnificent Montague in just a moment. If you suffer from pains of headaches, neuritis, and neuralgia, you should discover what many thousands have known for years, that Anison brings incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Probably at some time you have received an envelope containing Anison tablets from your physician or dentist. Thousands of people have been introduced to Anison this way. Try Anison yourself the next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. You'll be delighted at how quickly relief can come. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100 for your medicine cabinet. Ask for Anison today. And now, back to the magnificent Montague. <laughs> With thoughts of the picnic on his mind, he is just finishing his Uncle Goodhart radio program. Listen. Come, come, Ronald. All fun-loving boys celebrate the 4th of July. Some shoot firecrackers. Some light the sky rockets. You, Ronald, like to blow open banks, eh? <laughs> Dear listeners, this is just an example of the trouble you can get into on 4th of July. That is why your Uncle Goodhart has been urging you to spend the 4th of July at home, safe from accidents, and you will live once again to greet the new day with your eyes high into the sun and light. So ends another episode of Uncle Goodhart. And now, stand by as we announce the lucky winners of the Uncle Goodhart Letter Writing Contest. The prize-winning letter on the subject, How I Would Spend the Fourth of July at Home with Uncle Goodhart, was written in by Mr. and Mrs. Stonewall Putu of Hemlock Hill, Tennessee. Mr. and Mrs. Putu are on their way to New York, all expenses paid to fulfill their heart's desire. They will spend the Fourth of July in the happy home of Uncle Goodhart. the air, Mr. Montague. Good show. No, oh, that was a beaut. How do I keep out of jail? Ask our director, Mr. Zinza. Had a lot of heart to it, didn't it, Zinza? Oh, yes, sirree. That was a real doother. <laughs> oh, 
Mr. Hopkinson, sir. Yes, sir. Springer, what is he mumbling about? I distinctly heard the announcers say something about someone winning a contest about the 4th of July. No, oh, you mean the how I would spend my 4th of July in Uncle Goodhart's home. How I would spend my what with whom? Zinza, didn't you explain? You tell him. Zinza! Oh, dear. Well, you see, Mr. Montague, the people who won the contest get to spend 4th of July in your house. Don't hit me. <laughs> Zinza, my home is not a one-night stand for drooling idiots dragged in from the hinterlands by flugel soap. Yeah, but Mr. Montague, Mr. and Mrs. Patu won the contest in good faith. It was a national contest. The federal government have laws guaranteeing the prize. Good. Let the government be their host. Let them stay at Blair House. <laughs> Mr. Montague, this will mean trouble for you. Gentlemen, and I use the word loosely, <laughs> I'm going out on a picnic today. Mr. Montague, you can't go out. You've been campaigning for people to stay home on the 4th. We announced the winner would spend the 4th of July with you and get everything they mentioned in the letter. Get everything they mentioned? Where's the letter? Read it. Go on, Zinza. It says, round about sundown, Ma and I would climb into our Sunday go to meet and clothes and show up at dear Uncle Goodhart's diggings. Yeah. <laughs> Ma would give Uncle Goodhart's wife her own recipe for Southern Dixie goulash, which dear Aunt Goodhart would start cooking for dinner. Yeah. Then we would all sit around the fireplace, singing, gossiping, and playing the melodeon, and just to sitting and listening to Uncle Goodhart's homey philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> Signed, Mr. and Mrs. Stonewall Patu. That's all, Mr. Montague. It is? Yes. Oh, no. If you think I'm turning my apartment into a sharecropper's villa... Mr. Montague, you have a contract. But I must go to my picnic. Mr. Montague, they're coming in by bus. After two days and nights riding, they'll be dead tired. Yeah, they'll probably fall asleep. Uh, asleep. That's it. Now, Zinza, when you get them off that bus, I want you to take them sightseeing. Sightseeing in this heat? They won't make it. Fine. <laughs> when you arrive at my apartment with them at six o'clock, and when I open the door, I want them to fall in. <laughs> Out cold. any other way. Now, this is a fine time to tell me to cancel my picnic. I got a right to live, too. Agnes, I told you we were expecting Mr. and Mrs. Patu. Well, I think it's shameful getting those people tired just so we can walk out on them. And what did you want me to do? Sit around all night with them hog-calling? <laughs> well, Edwin, it may kill them. Oh, that's Zinza and the Patus. Come in. Zinza! Water, water. Grab him. Don't let him fall. <laughs> Agnes, a glass of water. Zinza, are you all right? I'm dehydrated. <laughs> walking, walking in that sun. Oh, uh, easy, old man. There you are. Uh, where are the Patoos? Right here. Mr. and Mrs. Patoo, this is Uncle Goodhart. Howdy. It's Uncle Goodhart. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? That's the rebel yell, Mr. Montague. He does it every ten minutes. My eardrums went on the third one. <laughs> oh, Zinza, you're shot. You'd better go. Uncle Goodhart, begging your pardon, sir, but it gives me great pride to present the little lady who I'm proud, mighty proud to say is my wife, Emmy May. Well, Lance, thanks a lot, my dear. If last week anyone was to tell me I'd be here little old New York and meet y'all, I would have said, you're just plump old Jesuit, and you better watch out. All me. right, Emmy. <laughs> She's a little loose in the lips. <laughs> well, where do we start, Uncle? I guess you're kind of tired. If you'd like to lie down, the beds are all... I didn't able the Uncle Goodhart, but if you don't mind, I'll just stand. Stand? Been riding on a bus two days and three nights. I'm kind of saddle sore. <laughs> if you get what I mean. <laughs> oh, no. Why, don't walk in the barn clown. Why, come and through Charleston. Better come up here on the bus, and this stranger says to him, all put. He, All right, Emmy. <laughs> she does take off. Did the Patoos arrive? Why, Uncle Goodhart, don't tell me this pretty little heifer sidling up to us is your wife, Auntie Goodhart. Uh, yes, the pretty little heifer is my wife. 
Lily, Mr. and Mrs. Patu. Welcome to New York and welcome to our home. I do declare, I thought when we left that little old Mason Dixon live, we left hospitality behind us. And here y'all talk like you've known us all night. All right, Emmy. Right, <laughs> well, what are you women folks standing around for? Get in the kitchen. Well, I got the best R.A. Oops, they're here, huh? Uh, this is Agnes. Well, well. And am I having the honor of meeting the fair daughter of your family? Mighty beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, my dear Mr. Patu. I do declare you are stretching southern chivalry to the breaking point. <laughs> this is Agnes, our maid. Your maid? Got one of those, huh? <laughs> your Abe Lincoln took ours away. <laughs> What are your plans, Uncle? Well, right now I'm thinking of personally firing on Fort Sumter and starting the whole war over again. <laughs> well, what are you women folks standing around here gassing for? I'm hungry. My stomach's hollering. Send it down, boy. Send it down. <laughs> well, a, a dinner is... You all are going to eat on the patoos tonight. Just like I said in our letter. MMA, fetch me the suitcase. Suitcase? Yes, sir. We brung our own vittles. Hey, you uh, Mrs. Goodhart. In this suitcase, we got all the makings for MMA's Dixie goulash. It's shocked full of hog jowls, turnip greens, hominy grits, fat back, chitlins, black-eyed peas. And for flavoring, a couple of squirrel heads. <laughs> Careful when you open it up, honey. Then riding on top of the bus for two days might be a little high. <laughs> What's the matter, Uncle? You look a little green. Uh, I'll be all right. Can't wait to wrap your gums around it, hey? <laughs> Tell his missus how to make it, Emmy May. Let's go, Agnes. Okay, you don't mind if I eat the suitcase? <laughs> Get, Agnes. Now, let's sit down by the fireplace, like we said in the letter, and sing some of them oldies but goodies. Well, I'm afraid I... Uh... Yeah. The Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia On the trail of the Lone Fire <laughs> Now that was a meal How about it, Mrs. Goodhart? There's still one squirrel head left No, thank you Why, honey You didn't taste enough to keep a bowl weevil crawling Hey, whatever did happen to Uncle Goodhart? He swallowed one mouthful and took off like a hound dog dipped in turpentine. <laughs> Don't explain it to him, Emmy. Uh, he'll be out in a minute. Uh, Agnes, will you clear the table? Clear it? I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> ah, here's Uncle. Uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. I, I'm still a little shaky. <laughs> will you, uh, Lily, will you, would you step, step out here? Well, what is it, Edmund? Lily, we've got to get them to sleep. Edwin, after that meal they put down, they can only stay awake another few minutes. Lily, we've got to put them to sleep. Well, do your Hamlet soliloquy. That hasn't missed yet. <laughs> Look, I saw him yawn. I'll go back. <laughs> Mighty tired after that meal. Oh, now, here, take this easy chair. Just sink into it. <laughs> After dinner, Stonewall usually just sits around sucking on his teeth with his belt off and his stomach just a growl and a growl and a growl. Oh, right. <laughs> See, how about another song? Camp Town brings back six miles. Wait, you just relax. Let me read you my philosophy, like you said in your letter. Ever hear of a writer called Shakespeare? Shakespeare? Can't say that I have. But Emmy May here, yeah, she was a high school teacher in Hemlock Hills. Emmy May, you ever hear of Shakespeare? No, but I declare we used to do a heap of reading out of the Sears robot cat. All right, Emmy. <laughs> Agnes, will you play the melodeon the studio set up? Just like we asked for in the letter. Uh, go ahead, Agnes. Stand by with the pillows, Lily. <laughs> Mighty pretty. Isn't it, Emmy May? So, well, I do declare I'm just... All right, Emmy May. 
Relax, my dear Mr. and Mrs. Patu. Let me read you Hamlet's soliloquy. Watch that, Uncle. There are women in the room. <laughs> <laughs> no, relax, relax. <laughs> listen, listen. To be or not to be, that is the question. Purdy. Mighty Purdy. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. They're asleep. Already? Congratulations, that's a new record. Let's go. No, no, let's make sure they're asleep. Mr. Patu. <laughs> Mrs. Patu. <laughs> Sit, Lily, the lunch baskets, on to the picnic. Here, Edward, let's go. Hurry, Agnes. Coming. Emmy May? Yeah. Is the old goat and his wife gone? Yeah. I thought we'd be hung up with them forever. Oh, so are you. Gosh. And now let's celebrate the fourth as it should be celebrated. Mrs. Patu, if you'll take my arm, we'll go out and get low dead. It's a glorious fourth of July. <laughs> Here's a word from RCA Victor. It will pay you to remember this name, the RCA Victor Regency. Yes, remember the Regency. Remember the Regency when you buy television. If it's value you want, remember the Regency. If it's performance you want, remember the Regency. And if it's quality you want, remember the Regency. Here is the world's finest television, RCA Victor 17-inch million-proof television, quality proven in over 2 million homes. Television with the clearest, brightest, steadiest pictures ever. And the Regency is more than a television set. Its superb console cabinet is a fine furniture piece, too. A magnificent example of RCA Victor craftsmanship that you'll be proud to have in your home. The Regency is available now at your RCA Victor dealers. Ask for it by name. Yes, remember the Regency. The console television that brings you more for your money. Write that name down now. The RCA Victor Regency. <laughs> Listen again next week, friends, to the magnificent Montague starring Monty Woolley. The Saturday night transcribed feature on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by Allison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by RCA Victor. World leader in radio, first in recorded music, and first in television. The Magnificent Montague was written by Nat Hyken and Billy Friedberg. Ann Seymour was Lily. Pert Kelton was Agnes. Also heard tonight were Art Carney, Johnny Gibson, John Griggs, and Ann Petoniak. Jack Ward was at the organ. This is Don Pardo speaking. <laughs>